So welcome, everybody. Um, we are broadcasting today from Telematic Media Arts in San Francisco, where we are currently exhibiting uh, When Dreams Are Reality, a generative sound art installation by Cristobal Martinez. Uh, the installation will be up here in our gallery um, until May 1st of this year. Um, the exhibition also includes and features online releases of stereo sound sculptures every two weeks, Wednesdays, that's when they'll be released, throughout the run of the show. There are already two that have been released and those can be found on our website, telematic.com. Today, as part of the show, we are pleased to be hosting a conversation with the artist Cristobal Martinez about the work, to place it in his oeuvre, and to discuss the questions uh, it raises about climate change, its effects, and our tendency to retreat or disavow, uh, retreat from or disavow the strife in our relationship with others, the natural world, and even ultimately ourselves. Cristobal is an artist and scholar who works as chair of the Art and Technology Program at the San Francisco Art Institute. He is a founding member of the Artist Hacker Performance Ensemble Radio Healer. He collaborates with composer Guillermo Galindo in the experimental electronic music duet, Red Calebra. And he is a member of the interdisciplinary indigenous art collective, Post Commodity. His work has been featured in leading national and international venues, including the Whitney Biennial, Documenta 14, and the historic land art installation, Repellent Fence at the US-Mexico border in Arizona. With a special interest in sound, Martinez conjures generative metaphors, activating them to produce powerful aesthetic encounters which provoke self-reflection, dialogue, and public pedagogy. Through his work, he inspires to render le legible human dilemmas, social amnesias, taboos, fears, and desires, challenging audiences to confront otherwise unpalatable difficulties. In 2015, Martinez completed a PhD in rhetoric, composition, and linguistics at Arizona, at Arizona State University. So again, welcome and uh, welcome Cristobal. I'm uh, delighted to have you uh, here today. Thank you, Clark. Uh, it's good to be here. As a way of getting started, uh, I was hoping that you might uh, introduce audiences to the project. Um, just to, for people who haven't had a chance to attend, to who haven't had a chance to uh, hear it for themselves, uh, to explain what it is, uh, how it's made, and uh, your sense of what it's about. Thank you, Clark. Okay, so the work titled When Dreams Are Reality, currently installed at Tel Telematic Arts, is a four channel quadraphonic generative sound work. Uh, it's a sound art piece that is driven by a set of algorithms that allows uh, for the projection of sound to take place over, a over an infinite duration of time without the sound uh, appearing as if it is a concrete recording. The way that the sound installation achieves this or how I achieve this in the sound installation is by making a series of uh, recordings in the studio. Uh, these recordings were recordings of analog synthesizers, electric bass, electric guitar, and electronic percussion. And so I recorded my performances of these instruments within a compositional framework and built a large library of performance, improvisatory performance, uh, but structurally composed or, or arranged and then created a algorithm that can draw from these performances and 
arranged them into the gallery space in a quadraphonic spatialized way, can arrange them and perform them back to a listener in real time. What that does is it allows me to collaborate with machines so that audiences can listen to an ever emergent gesture of sound. This ever emergent gesture of sound allows for a listener to sit reflectively within a space and experience musical ideas, sonic ideas without, well, immersed in an environment without experiencing the monotony of repetition that we oftentimes associate with an audio loop. Um, the installation, the sound installation at Telematic is both a sound piece and a text piece. Uh, accompanying the sound is an artist statement in the form of a poem. And the poem is a narrative or a character fiction, fictional narrative that tells the story of a person who is experiencing San Francisco at the time of the 2018 campfire when the city was engulfed in very thick and dense smoke, which is a scenario that repeated itself again in 2020. During the 2018 campfire, the, the sky turned a, a yellow ochre to an orange color. In 2020, the sky turned bright red. And so the um, text piece is providing you with both the character's perspective of what it sees, and then an, um, a self-implicating message of what the character does in response to the experience of living or having this brutal experience that is one, the urban experience further amplified by intense air pollution. In, in order to tell the story, you can go to Telematic and you can sit down in the gallery and the gallery has been lit in, um, in a hue uh, referencing the smoky sky. And you can listen to a generative sound installation that is uh, pulling from the musical traditions of jazz, but also the experimental music paradigms that are, that are, have a history in the Bay Area. Those paradigms innovated by artists like uh, Terry Riley, Paulino Oliveros, Marion Armache, uh, and of course, John Cage. And so you have this sort of fusion of ideas that are coming from jazz, experimental music, and computer generative sound, all fused together to create a, a mood, 
to communicate a sonic mood that reflects not the not the individual in the story but the soul of the city itself being choked out by smoke so the the sound installation at telematic is a context or it functions as a context for the narration of the character that is provided in the poem but to further augment the experience of the character to provide a a an experience of what the interiority of the character is in, in other words how the character feels how the character sees uh, I am releasing every other week um, uh, a new audio track that is the representing the experience of the individual, uh, the character, the protagonist in in this uh, piece, which is uh, uh, presented by uh, Telematic Arts and also uh, Gray Area. So, you know, it's a way of thinking about sound art in a positioning sound art to as a narrative, as a narrative piece, or leveraging the traditions of sound art to tell a, a highly programmatic story about an event that took place in the city that I experienced that uh, will be with me for the rest of my life because it, I found the experience to, I found the experience to, was, was disturbing, extremely disturbing, but it amplified what things that I was already disturbed by mm -hmm. as a uh, resident of um, the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Yeah, an intensification of, of what are becoming everyday conditions in some ways. Absolutely. I wanted yeah. to tell that story. Uh, you know, I appreciate what you're saying about it in terms of speaking to that moment and speaking to the story, but not representing it per se, instead uh, distilling an essence of it. And um, it's interesting because the... Um, that experience of the fires and because the installation is so uh, local, uh, some audiences have come in here and really said, oh yes, that's what it was um, like. And in some ways, it's, I think because we've really captured, you've really captured here um, the feeling of the day, but um, others have felt it even uh, in sort of more metaphorical terms, like some, uh, visitors recently described feeling like they were uh, underground. Mm. And in a way I thought that, right, that it's not like a depiction of the day, it's like how that day was feeling like you were underground. You, you know, that there's a, a core to the experience. Yes, because the smoke um, disrupts the metaphors we take for granted mm. when we think of sky. We, we oftentimes look at the sky uh, as potential. Uh, the sky represents potential, uh, metaphorically, where it's something to, it represents symbolically something to aspire, something aspirational. Right. The skies are aspirational. Yeah. An openness. But an openness, a, pos a sense of possibility. Mm. And then when the smoke rolls into town, we suddenly feel as if the sky is bearing down upon us. And that becomes a metaphor for the untenable economic scale of economy that exists in the Bay Area, where you mm. feel like the city is bearing down upon you. The exorbitant costs of living are bearing down upon you. And now suddenly the sky reflects, creates a sort of metaphorical congruency with the experience of the city. 
and it creates a um, re it creates realizations or it sort of forces us to reflect on our realities in ways that are quite difficult. Mm. Uh, have you conveyed the extent to which the story is, well, the experience of the day, but also write a retreat and a retreat specifically into the palliatives of internet pornography, uh, essentially, um, right? This is kind of a key moment is to say like, it's an experience of the day and an experience of suffocation, but also a uh, uh, articulation of the disavowal of the experience, right? Trying to retreat from the experience and in some ways pretend that it's not, uh, that it's not happening. And the way that we, the ways that we do that, the ways that we have to do that, and the ways in which this whole virtual experience is, um, I mean, in some ways we're doing it now, right? That we can not actually, in the midst of this pandemic, we can't actually interact with one another and we try to compensate for that, uh, through the tech. That's absolutely correct. That's how this, that's how this whole concept ties together. Conceptually, we're listening to uh, algorithmically driven sound art. It, it's algorithmic conceptually for a purpose, for a reason, because the context is the Bay Area. And what happens in the Bay Area, what the Bay Area, one of the things the Bay Area is famous for, in addition to the Golden Gate Bridge or Alcatraz or all of the, the, the icons associated with visiting the city or the city's beauty, its iconic beauty, is the technology industry. And so we have a city that is, from my perspective, become increasingly um, a technologic, a campus, if you will, for technology corporations. City has become a tech campus. And the discourse of this tech campus is that everything is that problems can be solved via digital means. So if there is a problem in the world, an app can surely be written to solve it. And so there is a ideology, a positivistic ideology that through all things digital, that we will uh, aspire to some level of transhumanism, some level of posthumanism that is going to bring us toward um, uh, a, a more desirable future for all of humanity. Well, the, uh, that one critique of this kind of uh, discourse is that um, while the, there may be an ideology of, of uh, tectopian progress at play within the Bay Area, it also appears to, to me as uh, a place to escape or it serves as a, as a retreat or a way to retreat from the, and anesthetizes us from the realities we really are facing in the world. And I wanted to bring the discourse of virtual reality into close proximity with pornography because I wanted to create a scenario where a character gets to speak in the first person so that when the words are read, they're read by the viewer in the first person, mm. creating a kind of self-implicating moment 
when we try to look at ourselves in the in an in a way that is strongly implicating of how we are and what we're doing to the land, to earth, to life, through our current um, ways of being. So, um, can I pick up on that? You yeah. know, this piece uh, to me, uh, it almost feels like a, a companion uh, to the piece that you made with post commodity um, uh, that's the sonification of the Millennium Tower, uh, the point of final collapse. And um, specifically, it seems to have a similar structure in terms of calling attention to um, right, the overheated San Francisco uh, economy, the precariousness and um, intensity, in some cases, devastation of the um, economy, and then juxtaposes that, uh, in that case, to the, um, to the palliatives of new age well care, frankly. Yes, uh, is, is that a fair uh, analogy? Do you see them as, uh, consistent and um, is that structure consistent in your thinking? It's um, from my perspective impossible um, not to be strongly and overwhelmingly influenced by the work of post commodity because my arts practice is built on collaboration and the epicenter and priority of my practice is as an artist in post-commodity. Post-commodities, the point of final collapse provides a a metaphorical express, expression, a conceptual idea that is in a way functions as, as an apex example of all things San Francisco in terms of its economic its way of thinking about capitalism, or it's definitely its way of expressing capitalism. And it's once that's been stated as if the foundational discourse of the city, it's really hard to get away from that because it's seen and felt, at least for me as an artist, it, I saw it and felt it everywhere I went, absolutely everywhere I went in the city. And it wasn't only what I was seeing and what I was feeling, it was all the stories people were telling me mm -hmm. about their struggles. And so um, this work is calling upon a different, it uses a different modality um, of, it uses a different, I would say a different, its own unique set of metaphors or its own unique system of metaphors to uh, continue to call attention to a Bay Area economy that, where it's very hard to sustain life unless, of course, you're wealthy. And I think what differentiates this work from 
the work of post-commodity is that here there is a very uh, pointed critique at technology and technological discourse within the context of the technology industry. And now that's present in the point of final collapse. But the point of final collapse uses, uses media to tell a story and that media also ha happens to be technology. But here the technology that is used in when dreams are reality is, a, is, is, is an actual context by which to position experience, a, a, an experience, a viewer's experience uh, right within the Tectopian uh, discourse itself. So I think it's more the interior, what I'm describing in this work is that there is an, in, it's about looking at an issue outside of oneself, but in order to do that, really examining how one feels. Mm. Um, you know, that self-reflective moment and the, um, well, in a sense, the sort of privacy of the piece, um, for me, that uh, anticipates my follow-up, which is, could you say more about what it is to be presenting this work um, not in a collaboration and how your uh, personal practice as an artist um, has a kind of different place in your uh, oeuvre? Yeah, that's a great question. And the issue of privacy or privateness or it there's this um, presence of the individual that is strongly emphasized in this work which is also part of the criticism or also mm. part of the narrative um, you go up to be alone yeah you sometimes uh, when a work is so intimate um emotionally or spiritually or intellectually uh, intimate and personal, like strongly personal. That's when it makes sense to make, for me to make a solo piece mm. where I feel like, you know, this is just something that is so um, much of, about the things that this is just so this piece is so much about sharing very personal things very uh, personal experiences while at the same time withholding many personal experiences but there's just something hugely individualistic about the desire to want to tell from the desire that I have to want to tell this story in relationship to my personal experience. Yeah. So that, that's, it's a pragmatic choice then to mount a solo exhibition about this. Um, but the, the idea of the solo exhibition is analogous to the loneliness that I see hmm. and that I witnessed um, throughout the city and that I myself have also felt as a resident of the city. And so, um, yeah, I thought that this um, there was something about 
when the city is enshrouded in smoke and the sky turns colors, mm -hmm. there is a sense of wonder, beauty of those colors, and absolutely a sense of fear, heaviness, as you describe earlier. There's a sense of deep grief, solemnity, and loneliness. And so the city, the spirit of the city is lonely. This person witnessing this, living this, is lonely. And just has to retreat into a world that reflects, in many ways, the, the cause, that is in many ways the cause of the problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just, um, it's just, I think my experiences were so, so strong. Um, so they became, I think, part of my bones. My experiences became part of my bones. And I had to, in this work, I have to tell the story. I have to tell the story in the way that I feel it in my bones. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a very personal expression. That talking about the grief and, uh, you know, in that context, then I, I see the character as um, some way sort of refusing to do the work of mourning. Uh, you know, in, mm. in, in turning away from the day and retreating and, and in some ways then to think about, right, the experience of the installation as, because it is, you know, people come in here and especially under COVID conditions, it's, it's frequently uh, just solitary people who are sitting and listening and, or, you know, walking through the room and um, essentially um, meditating. Yes, in that's a way, the idea. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, it, in some ways, it sort of captures kind of the, the isolation of the character. But in yes. a different way, I see the piece kind of doing that work of grieving and, uh, you know, in kind of the, the space that it opens up, actually as a collective practice, right? That, that um, you invite uh, the public into, um, into the space and to reflect on it with you and essentially to engage you in a dialogue, but a dialogue that's, you know, rooted in affect and strong feelings. And um, yes. Yeah. Yes. That I, that's really beautifully stated. And what I would say is that it's, um, it's that the piece is grieving. Hmm the protagonist in the story is retreating. And that's the, the reason why it's important to show that retreat and to show how dark, how deep and dark that retreat goes and the leveraging of the technology that is created in the area to enable that retreat to happen is exactly how I see the city behaving mm. in relationship to homelessness. Mm. And that's why this story becomes, an, for me, an important story to tell because it, it is a moment when it doesn't matter what your status is in the city. Mm -hmm. Everybody was under the, under the stress of poor air quality. Well, at the same time, I do acknowledge that some people suffered more than others because of racism. And there was environmental racism present in that moment. And there was privileges and power present in that moment. 
But at the same time, we, we did experience a sky in a particular way that was very, um, that very much closely resembles um, apocalypse and provides us with a, an experience that an artist like me might be able to leverage in order to generate a complex system of emotions, ideas, and knowledge that uh, might complicate uh, my audiences in a way that helps us think about what we might consider to be better stewards of each other, our neighbors, each other, uh, the city, and its surrounding lands, and especially um, at this, um, what I can, what we all know as the a time when extinction and climate change is out now all very well underway. Well, that, you know, that sense of uh, apocalypse, um, for me, that uh, also speaks to the way that if the piece is uh, site-specific in many ways and yes. uh, rooted in a very concrete and local context and um, experience, a specific moment, um, that it is, uh, in other respects, uh, again, kind of an embodiment of that rift, right? I mean, the, the, if, if something's being grieved, it is, in some ways, uh, the natural world as such. And, right, and so there, here's this moment in San Francisco at this particular day, um, but you know Galveston's getting its uh, hurricanes and uh, the Caribbean and right. I mean, in other words, the, the other catastrophes are presenting themselves um, elsewhere, and uh, the piece, in, to that extent, speaks to this much broader condition. Yeah, absolutely. You know, n nature as a creative force. Uh, artists are in many ways mimic nature, we will use a myriad of modalities that we have our, at our disposal to tell a story or to inject ideology into a system or to call into question an issue. But whatever it is that we do with our art, we do a lot of different things with it in many different places at many different times. In a lot of ways, I think it's, it's reflecting nature. Nature uses many different modality, uses many different modalities, has many tools and many expressions at its disposal to mm. exert pressure when pressure is, um, when there are uh, forces within itself that, um, that are um, perhaps disrupting a sense of balance. Mm. And so we, have, we deal with smoke in San Francisco and People in Florida or the Caribbean or, and all over the southern United States and the eastern seaboard are dealing with hurricanes. And some forces of nature are experienced more destructively than others. But it is, you know, the, the land is speaking in various ways at various times, uh, and I think the message is clear. 
we're, we're just very complicated. Mm. Humans, I believe we humans are very complicated and we want, we don't, um, it's hard for us to sometimes it's become hard for us to work together uh, to problem solve. And it's because we have, we live in a colonized world where the individual is valued above all. And so many young people argue that it, it's okay for them not to wear a mask or it's okay for them to be in public spaces and, and not to follow CDC guidelines because they, they usually say, well, it's, I'm young, it's, it's not gonna hurt me. And because that's the discourse of the individual that is that, that um, we have all been raised and within and suspended by in the colonial world or you know, in this colonized and colonizing environment that uh, we've, we've been brought up in. You know, uh, when you were talking about the artist and, and speaking from nature, and now talking about uh, colonialism uh, in some ways as, a, as, a, as the counterpoint, um, I wonder about the role of the land in your work. Is that always uh, the starting point? I think about the piece that you did in uh, Athens um, at Aristotle's Lyceum and the, uh, the wisdom of born of walking and mm -hmm. um, of the migrant uh, experience and thinking about that as a knowledge that's rooted like in the feet and in the land. Mm -hmm. Um, and then thinking about this piece, in a way, it's to say, oh, it's in the sky. But mm -hmm. um, again, it's the, it's the land that's burning. And it's, um, right. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Post-commodities primary discourse are a, a belief in the collective about what it does is in its artist statement, which is to connect indigenous narratives of self-determination to the public sphere. And the idea of indigenous self-determination always goes back to land in the relationship between indigenous people and the land by which they reside. That's how we've been raised. That's how all of us artists and post-commodity have been raised. So it always goes back to land because the land is how one comes to understand who one is in the world and what one's relationships are with our kin, which is not only our families or our pueblos or our communities or our tribes or our nations, it's also the animals, it's also the earth and it's also the, the trees and, and the plants. And so that's just what you're seeing is you're seeing uh, me as an artist operate within the worldview that I was raised in. And so when we think about the grief, sure, people can be inundated by smoke and that can last for a week. And that is horrible. And people's lungs hurt and people develop disease and experience asthma and so forth. And the, and the symbolic um, impact, the experiential impact of seeing uh, death, the specter of death fall upon the city that you live in 
when the, as the smoke is present, people will retreat, like as in the character within, within my piece. But it's not only in the fantasies that people retreat. People also retreat in their work. Sometimes people can get mm. even more entrenched in their work, in labor, within digital environments, specifically and dominantly in, in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, but at the same time, when the smoke clears and people just keep droning on, but some of us are still hurting because we know the devastation. We know the ecological devastation and we think very empathetically and very compassionately about what that means. What that means for future generations. What that means for us, what that means for our family, what that means for our kin. What that means in terms of the loss of life. And that's something that is I think that's, that's what I mean when I say when dreams are reality, it's when a dream, a living dream of wearing a virtual reality headset to enter into a pornographic world is a, not a very, may not be thought as a very nice expression or response to the situation. It's reflecting something, it's reflecting an act that reaches across in terms of our capacity to empathize with one another. And if we can't, as humans, empathize with one another, I fear for my kin, like the trees, for example, because we're seeing that happen now in a pandemic. We've got, you know, well over half a million people who have died over the course of one year. And we, we don't seem to be as a greater society too interested in grieving so much as we are dying mm. to get back to life as it was before the pandemic. Mm. And so the, this is a crisis. This is a sort of when the dream, the virtual dream is potentially so ugly that it reflects what's actually happening mm. in, in the world we are reaching this, we're just in crisis. And I don't think what I'm sharing is revelatory in any way at all. I believe we know this, many of us know this, but it puts a feeling to it. It, it helps, I think, to put a feeling to it, to put a certain experience to it, so that we might just take a little bit of time out, maybe as a, maybe as a, a form of, of prayer, maybe as yeah. a form of just thinking for a little bit. Yeah. I think though that actually your, uh, your perspective uh, is in some ways, uh, you're saying that 
<clears throat> we're familiar with this, that we know that we're in a state of crisis. I think in other respects, though, some of the, the targets of your essentially kind of ideology critique, um, like if, again, hearkening back to uh, the point of final collapse, that you evoke the whole industry that has grown up to try to uh, assuage our anxieties, right? That yes. there's, this, so there's a whole economic, there's the, there's the source of the anxiety, and then there's the whole extra economy that has developed that's, you know, tell, tell yourself it's okay, tell yourself everything's going to be all right, right? That, um, oh, you know, you'd like, you uh -huh. feel better, it's okay to feel good, <laughs> be attentive to yourself, right? Um, yes. That in a way, you're, it, that rhetoric is so prevalent, right? And, and really at every uh, level of discourse these days, the importance of like attending to yourself and affirming self yourself and self-help yeah. and, and people's need for it. And that you say, -care. you know what, -care. Um, it's, it's right, that it's hard to right, take issue with people's self-care in some ways, but in other respects to say like, well, really what we need to be doing is to, uh, attending to things that are more difficult and that don't feel like self, I mean, maybe this is self-care, but in a way, um, it's a self-care that involves uh, not turning away from the anxiety, but um, confronting the uh, anxiety and, um, or again, not turning away yes. from the grieving. Um, and yes. in this piece, again, just specifically to name it, um, another, you know, here we are in, uh, at 10th and Folsom, uh, San Francisco is also famous for its kink, right? And that's another source, I take it, for the city and to recognize that in some ways, as transgressive as it seems, kink has essentially become one of our very commonplace kind of palliatives. And, and you know, another way to kind of make yourself um, feel better as um, the world is coming apart and, you know, you feel yourself implicated in it. Yes, there, there's nothing, um, it's a, it's a tough story. It's a cutting story. It's a little offensive, frankly, it's, right? It's a little it's bit a tough, rude. Yeah, it's a really tough story. It's really cutting. And um, it's frightening, too. Not only if we think about it, um, if we take the time to entertain the narrative, but it's also a scary story to tell. Because you have because these things are things that are celebrated. And to be a contrarian through the telling of the story is always, it requires a, you know, a little bit of, um, you just have to be courageous. You just have to try to be courageous, but it's in being in trying to be courageous, in trying to tell a story that comes from an honest place or a place within your heart that runs contrary to popular imagination. Yeah. You, you can have all the, from my perspective, you could have all the courage in the world to do that. It doesn't make it any less it doesn't make you any less vulnerable or any less frightened. But sometimes there are stories that need to be told. That's my job. I'm an artist. And I found it that my vocation in life is to tell the stories that need to be told that aren't necessarily easy to listen to or easy to tell. I try to do this in a way like, not in a moralistic way. I try to do this in a way that where we could see ourselves, where we could, where we could be part of the story. And that it's okay to be part of the story. And yeah, the, the story hurts, could hurt, but it's, it is, Exactly as you say, it is an experience that provokes us to confront the aspects of our humanity 
that we time and time again are in denial over. And yeah. if we did that, we might be able to use it as a tool because these anxieties might compel us to change our systems maybe in a small way, but maybe in the aggregate, uh, a very big, meaningful and impactful way. Indeed. But it, you and, know, and that's part of being the, the that's part of being, uh, uh, um, that's part of the work. There's, there's a humor to it. Yeah. There's a humor to the work. Uh, and it's, that, it's not, it's not without its, care and compassion either. And I don't want to right. overstate that. In some ways, it's the palliatives that you are, you know, critiquing. In some ways, they're, they're, um, they're not actually comforting, right? And, and in at the moment where you really start to feel the feelings in all of their difficulty, um, there also is a, a, a um, an effective reward for that, right? Sort of a sense of kind of coming to terms and um, yes. understanding what's going on in your life. Yes, absolutely. And that's why the whole situation, that's part of the reason why the whole situation is aestheticized. So that, well, if there is a presence of beauty, we might be able to look at it even if the beauty is pointing to something difficult, but at the sense, but also the idea of something beautiful taking you through something difficult can lead to something even more beautiful, which is the capacity for transformation and change yeah yeah that's that's compelling that's it's a very subtle point right when you're talking about so-called aestheticizing it but what i hear you saying is that beauty is not um what's not prettifying and it's also ultimately it's not about denial of ugliness in fact beauty yeah. in some ways is all about those uh tensions and resonances that ultimately hinge on some difficulty or ugliness, frankly. It's definitely drawing the continuity and not looking mm. at it as a binary, not looking at it as a binary, but looking at it as a, a sort of continuous wavelength. And, mm -hmm. and it can be tuned in various ways that allow us to resonate along that continuity. Mm. And, you know, with this um, possibility that we might see something that we don't see when we think about these things as mutually exclusive from one another. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, that, that the language of resonance um, draws me back to just fundamentals about what it means for you to be working with sound in a visual art um, context. Is there, is there something about the kind of, uh, again, emotional register of music that is central to your practice? There is, um, so my practice is, um, I stated earlier, I built my career on collaborative practice. And so I always use the we because there's never really any me. It's mostly the we because that's, that's how I operate as an artist and, and the we you know, the collectives you mentioned when you introduced me, we've always believed in the power of experience, sensing the world. So we like to create immersive experiences. We like to create experiences and focus the craft on the on the anticipated experience as opposed to like an object or a thing. Mm -hmm. It's more the experience and how, and the metaphors used to drive the experience. And 
So we really believe, I think, in an immersive art, in a pedagogic, an, that, an, that an immersive art is this sort of grounds for pedagogy and that sound plays an important role in experience. And it's been a critique of me and my collaborators is that if you think even about the, the modern art era, like what is codified in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, you find that the Western worldview is really a structuring of silence. And there, from the indigenous perspective that I bring, which is a mestizo perspective, I see a lot of, when I think of art, I hear a lot of things. I see a lot of things. I smell a lot of things. I, the world is all around my body. And so I like to think about making work that is all around the body. So, you know, when you go to telematic, it, the expectation is, yeah, you won't see a, necessarily a projection that is gonna draw your focus or you, you won't see a, an object necessarily that you're gonna gaze at because I want the, the audience, my audience to, to look inside. I don't want them to look at something over there. I just want them to look inside, but also through the inside, look outside, look outwardly. And so, um, there is a visual experience that is profound in the space. And that visual experience is how the space is lit, which is the same color as the sky when the smoke was present. So to put you in a kind of simulated environment, which is funny because we're talking about simulated environments like the VR, mm -hmm. like the VR porno. Sure. It's just to put you in the simulated environment so that you can remember. It's a, it's a memory, really, like a constructed memory. Um, but there's something that you see and there's something that you hear, but it's just not in the form of an object that draws your direct attention. Mm -hmm. Because the quadraphonic nature of the installation has this sort of 4D sound quality to it where sound is moving in the space. Sound is traveling and sound is morphing and sound is changing. And I, I really uh, drew my inspiration strongly from Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, because that, that is an, an idea of sound an idea of art, an idea of music, where it's all around you and it is moving and traveling and changing. And it creates a sense or a mood or a place that provides you with a context for I guess in many ways, feeling yourself be alive. As a final question, you've, you've touched on it in a number of different ways uh, through the talk, but um, I'd like to revisit the question of what it means for you to be working at the intersection of art and technology, because it seems to me you've got a very specific and unique take on um, that intersection. Yes, that's that's so that's that's true. I um, this has been a long uh, journey for me. The uh, expressions of art and technology. Um, I don't see myself as an artist, you know, who who makes art and technology. Although I use a lot of technology 
like emergent media technology, cutting edge technologies in my work. I just see myself as a person who is in the 21st century. Mm. And so I make work with the material that I have access to. Like, you know, artists have done since time immemorial. If, if you had access to a chisel and a rock, and that was your medium, you made art with that. And I have access to computers. I have access to plastic mediums. I'm not talking about like plastic. I'm talking about like in the plastic arts, I have access to paint, materials for sculpting, um, ready-mades, um, and computers. And algorithms and data become art material as well, just like paint is art material. And so I did know that technology requires a literacy. You know, we call them digital literacies. And I knew that, see, we can access digital media, each and every one of us. It's like in our pockets, like in our cell phone, or, you know, a lot of people have a computer or, or a smartphone or both. That's common now. And so we have access to it, but our access is actually privileged in relationship to the degree to which we have acquired literacy around it. And I knew that if I wanted to operate as an artist in the 21st century, with access to all of the materials afforded by this time in place that I'm living in, that I needed to educate myself um, in matters such as uh, engineering and software engineering. And so, you know, I got, I studied art as an undergraduate. I studied engineering as a, as a master's student and and then I went on to study linguistics as a way to put it all together. Um, for me, I think a lot of my contemporaries in art and technology are speaking a lot about innovation. And there's a lot of um, circular discourse like, you make a technology to critique a technology. And there is admittedly some of that happening in my own work here. But this story is a story about the, the land in a time of global warming and the experience of living in a time of climate change. Or, and many people don't believe in that. But what I can say is that it's living in a time of fire. Mm. And that's undeniable to all of us across the political spectrum. It is about living in a time of fire. And what I want to do with art and technology, what I want to do with technology, whether that is a, a stone, a polished stone, a stick, or an artificial intelligence, I just want to use all those tools to tell the story of our time. And I am indifferent about whether it is a stick or a computer in the sort of general sense, but I just try to understand as an artist, what is the right tool necessary for telling a particular story that I'm interested in telling? And in some cases, it's a computer, and in some cases, it's not. Yeah. Well, Christopher, thanks for your time today, and, and thanks for your extraordinary work. I'm delighted to be uh, showing it here at uh, Telematic and um, 
for our audiences. I hope you will take the opportunity to come down here and uh, immerse yourself uh, in the work. It's really um, beautiful and uh, moving. Uh, difficult in many ways that we've discussed, but uh, ultimately uh, worth it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Clark. Uh, I want to thank Telematic for um, uh, the generous support of Telematic in staging this exhibition. I also want to give a shout out to Gray Area for co-presenting um, the online component of this work. And I also want to thank Ian Montgomery, uh, a uh, drone uh, pilot who generously allowed me to use uh, an image of um, the city uh, that was, uh, that is a video still of some drone footage he shot during the, um, the smoke in San Francisco in the 2018 campfire. Um, and I also, you know, this is a, this is a unique, this is a strange time um, it's a unique experience to show a work during a pandemic. And this is the first work that I show in a pandemic. And so I don't get the social interaction that I am um, normally accustomed or usually that I, that I would get in a pre-pandemic world. And so I just have to imagine people going to the gallery. I imagine people going online to all of you who are out there uh, engaging with uh, my art, um, this particular piece, When Dreams Are Reality. I uh, just wanna thank you so much for um, your time, your interest and your support. So thank you everyone. Indeed, wonderful. Thanks again, Cristobal. Thank you. Take, Take care. care.